Cool, and we're rolling. So welcome to the Big Picture Film Club podcast. What we do at Big Picture Film Club, we really aim to champion and promote uh, British filmmaking talent. And I have my two good friends here, Graham Higgins. Higgins, I remembered him this time. And Damien Swaby. Cool. Uh, both of you guys are directors, writers and producers would it be fair to say that and i know yeah. you do a bit of acting as well yeah um uh, and i know you're um so like me and uh, damien go way 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 back uh six years or something like that yeah about that yeah, yeah. um so uh, i know that you do a variety of like short films social commentary uh music videos as well and graham <clears throat> we uh well we screened um your film my lend uh, with us and uh, actually can you tell us about how that's going and like, what's yeah um, so uh, My Lens an independent feature film shot in East London and uh, it's about these two guys who they're both unemployed and they, they meet while they're out running and they become like, running mates and it's a psychological thriller it's at the time of the financial crisis and things take a darker turn when a young banker is found murdered uh, and the film kind of takes off from there um so it was all shot in east london and uh you know it was a kind of very low budget film but it's it's done really well it's been uh, in festivals all this year and last year it's been in about a dozen festivals and it's won six awards at festivals uh three for best film it's also won awards for the music and the cinematography. Wow. So, uh, yeah, it's it's one of those projects which is kind of labour of love and you start off doing it really small and then it kind of gets a bit of momentum. You get people on board and it's, you know, it's gone way beyond what I, I thought it would be, you know. So, um, and it's being released uh, for video on demand uh, in the UK and USA on Flix Premiere. Wonderful, um, wonderful. Exclusively. Um, we'll add a clapping noise to the <laughs> podcast at some so point. So that's on the uh, the fifth, the Saturday, the fifteenth of April in the UK, yeah. and Friday, the twenty eighth of April in the USA. Uh, and it's it's particularly good. It's on in the yeah. USA because one of my lead actors, Mark Arnold, is an American actor who's based in London. So, oh, okay, and he's a he's an amazing actor, really experienced, and uh, so I was very lucky to get him to do the film. Uh, and he kind of yeah. He, He's really good in the film. Um, so it'd be great for a lot of people in America to be able to see him, to be able to stream it. Awesome. So there you have it, folks. Tune in and uh, get Flix premiere and watch My Land. I really recommend it. Um, it's, I mean, you say, you say, quote unquote, low budget, but I think it's, <laughs> it's very, it's a very well to told story, very well produced. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I'm, I'm tip my hat off to you and like i'm just happy that like us at big picture film club we could screen it yeah, and uh yeah. damien uh what can i say we haven't actually seen each other for um maybe two years yeah yeah i think it's about two years yeah so i mean what, <laughs> what's uh in as far as like your the, the film world like what's been up behind the camera well i've been uh, last year and this year i've been doing mainly documentaries yeah. Um, I've got my Black Lives Matter UK documentary. Oh wow! Coming out in the summer this summer. Yeah. And I'm doing another one about Trump and his um, the special relationship between America and England. Yeah. Awesome. And one about Brexit. That'll be out a year after we voted out. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, as far as when you're tackling these big public issues and these big questions i mean how are you what is your thought process going into filming it uh, as far as or how how do you plan how or do you plan how it's gonna you plan to produce the film or you just kind of let nature take its course and if you see one person and you have an interview with them and they're like uh, i believe xyz and then you just keep that in or what? oh yeah i'm very open like I, my yeah. main thing is um to come outside my well I'm not, I'm not I don't really live in a bubble particularly but I come outside my bubble come outside the people I would usually talk to 
um, places I'd usually go and get a, a, a very wide scope of opinions yeah. to make it um, an honest documentary and to make um where they should be they should be they sh- well in my opinion sometimes they shouldn't be opinion pieces yeah. they need to be they need to reflect what is actually happening and what people are thinking and how they feel if you can just talk closer sorry, to the mic so how sorry. they how they feel um yeah so i don't really have a plan as such i i, I kind of just have my technical plans and my technical viewpoints on how to get things done my workflow yeah but i kind of go go with the flow making it making them okay um and uh, this is kind of a question for both of you guys now um so you kind of you both you know, obviously you both do film and kind of both do go about it in different ways but as far as uh, like funding for films that's obviously a big challenge micro budget or not yeah um i, I guess how have each of you found it have you like have you uh, like done like a, a gofundme or kickstarter sort of campaign or is it all out of pocket stuff or do you get private investors in or at the moment <clears throat> for those documentaries i mentioned uh, i funded myself okay but for other documentaries they've been more kind of corporate or um you know for like a aerospace company or something like that so it's oh, wow. like it's more cool. of a case of like <laughs> a paid job rather than yeah fund b to make my project yeah, yeah, but yeah. i'm definitely um probably 2019 i'm going to look into different ways that's for sure yeah and graham how about yourself because obviously uh, particularly with my lens because that's that's a feature and yeah. I, I, su- I suppose there's a lot more there's a lot more demands technically um, that goes into producing um, I think when you're making a feature. a feature at this level, it's it's like guerrilla warfare, really. You're, you're just trying to pull in everything you can to do it uh, the most economically you can. I mean, I didn't do a Kickstarter or... Um, and the reason I didn't... Well, there's probably a couple of reasons. I think, first of all, I, I didn't think I had a big enough network of people to do a Kickstarter. Uh, I thought I could probably raise a, you know, a few grand and and the time involved and the energy... I felt like it would it would postpone me actually making the films, and I just yeah. thought I had, <laughs> they kept offering me these massive um, you know limits on my on this credit card I have, and I just <laughs> thought <laughs> I'm just going to use it. And I and I did that classic thing that you know independent filmmakers always do is they just put it on the credit card. Ouch. You know? <laughs> um, and the, the other thing is as well, I think it's funny when you're younger and you you haven't got as much of a a career established it's harder to borrow money but as you you know once you go i've got i've got a a job that i my full-time job as well so i mean you just have more ability to borrow money and uh and i'm hoping now when the film's released i'll I'll get some of my money back i mean i i think it's possible i could get it get a return on my investment uh if the release goes uh, as hoped um but uh, yeah i think i think it's but I mean, I think the other factor in in a film like this is is how skilled you can be in pulling in the favors and getting people. So, like for example, the the cinematographer Anna Valdez Hanks, she has her own Alexa kit which she hires out, yeah. and because she said she wanted to do the film, she she brought the kit. So okay. then suddenly we're shooting on an Alexa, and it looks like Very you nice. know really classy and and that kind of thing. You can't really budget for that. It's just she liked the script and it was just in some ways it's fortune but it's also putting yourself in the right place and having a thing that, that is desirable to people who, who can, will come on board so I see it's not just about the money at this level it's also about where you can get people behind the project and get them to feel that passion for it that you do and then you know you, you do find that things start to happen that you wouldn't have thought you would would be possible um same goes for the actors actually yeah um the caliber of actors you can attract if if yeah and we're taking a brief intermission <laughs> so. and we're thing to say, back yeah. with the big picture film club podcast um actually i wanted to um talk to you like we spoke about um obviously funding for films um have either have either one of you or have has it thought has it gone past in your mind to kind of uh, uh, 
look for film grants because I know particularly with like BFI or Film London. Well, I have, the, but they they seem to. Um, or is that for whatever reason you haven't? It just seems, worked out, or it just seems they want obviously well, they're giving the money, but it just seems like the type of control and restrictions okay. and, and things that they that they want. Um, like you, I may be wrong, but I think I read in one of them like you have to have a producer with your, um, you know, when you apply for funding. Yeah. And, um, you know, things like that. I mean, like I, could, I produce my own stuff. So maybe in the future I'd work with a different producer or a better producer or an established producer. But it's, it just felt like there's a lot of restrictions when you go for grants. Yeah. Um, but who knows in the future, innit? Graham? Uh, I've oh. had uh, funding in the past. I, uh, I'm from Liverpool originally and I made a short quite a few years ago now but it was a 10 minute short which I shot in Liverpool and got funding from the National Lottery and from the local agencies in Liverpool and the whole theme of it was very based in Liverpool so um, but I then I later moved to London I, I just found it much harder to get that kind of funding I think there's it's so much more competitive in London there's so many people making films so many. and I think also what's changed now is the technology's changed a lot that you can just go out and do something now. So uh, it, it just, I just have this feel that I get quite impatient and I just want to yeah. do the thing yeah, and yeah, I don't definitely. want to spend the time doing applications and then waiting because all those things set you back waiting. And I, I kind of, you've got to decide, I think, whether you just want to, you know, how passionately you want to get on and do this thing or, you, or you're going to do that route of, of you know, it's like with fe feature scripts in development, you know, they can just take years in yeah. development and people, are, producers are waiting for these projects. And yeah. uh, that must be so, I don't know how they cope with that. Because <laughs> you watch your life just yeah. kind of ebbing away with this thing you're burning to do. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, is, you actually touched on the issue, well, you touched on using technology and how that's kind of evolved in your filmmaking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one thing I, um, one thing I, I've seen more prominently is like filmmakers shooting on iPhones even yeah. and kind of obviously not a stock lens but like with a clip on lens or like yeah. an adaption um, as far as producing your films does um, I mean how much thought do you put into the the technology you have available to you in terms to a hundred percent you know i'm always thinking about the technology available because of the pace it, the rate it moves um and your workflow and the ability i mean the cost we need to think back before this digital era people like roger corman how they used to make films and what we've got now yeah it's just unbelievable i mean it's literally um, for my iphone i've got a 50 millimeter lens a telephoto lens um a zoom lens you know uh, and you can just go out, you can get a Filmic Pro app. I could shoot something now and edit it on my phone on the way home yeah. and put it up on YouTube. So, you know, I haven't done that, but I, it's, it's, it's an option. So I think it's all great. I mean, have you ever yourself thought about using your iPhone for anything? Um, see, I, I also run um, um, a little um, uh, health and fitness company called ZFit Health. Mm. So we sell health and fitness products, and uh, for that, uh, for like Instagram, I've been uh, doing like um, I'm currently on like a hundred day fitness challenge. Nice. Um, so I'm on day like ninety three at the moment. So yeah. Um, and um, so for Instagram, I put like I, I just like using iMovie. That's yeah. very simple to create like very short pieces, for example. Uh, but I, to the extent of creating like a short film on, I, 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 I don't think I could. Because I, I think not for the sorry, not for the technology reason. As in, I, I don't think I'm a, a film producer in that sort of regard. Yeah, yeah. But there's I, a lot of restrictions with iPhone technology as well. Yeah. I mean, you can um, memory wise, you know, yeah. you're not going to have the, the memory of a, a mirrorless camera or DSLR or something. But if you wanted to make one minute videos, I think they're brilliant. If that, if you didn't have any think else, you know. Yeah. I think it depends on the kind kind of film you're making. I mean, I can imagine like for a, 
fly on the wall kind of documentary uh, yeah. an iPhone would be brilliant because it's so mm. unobtrusive and if you were trying to go to a place where people were going to be more self-conscious if you take out a big camera you know it has yeah. real advantages you might get much better interviews you did right on an iPhone because the people aren't as intimidated by the big shoulder cam yeah, they yeah. Um, but the other thing is I always think it's the it's the start of filmmaking because you can get you know you, if you take someone like David Fincher how controlled the way he makes films is you couldn't imagine him doing something on an iphone uh, and other films are much more like the, the camera observes and it and it, it's almost like a witness to something and yeah. and in those kind of films the 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 camera is 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 intervening less in terms of shots it's it's kind of recording okay. uh, observing and and so i think it just depends on the type of filmmaker you are i mean i think okay. i'm more inclined towards um, they're kind of more, I suppose, well, not conventional, but the, the idea that the camera, uh, you construct the, the visuals through the camera. You don't just observe with the camera. And I know this is a bugbear among some cinematographers about yeah. in the modern, more modern, the era we're in now, that people tend to just use cameras to record things, even in, in drama, and they're not okay. actually constructing the story through the camera, through the... Um, so it's quite interesting, you know, the challenges of that, what, what you get from different technology. Okay, I'm keen to know, <clears throat> given that, um, yeah, given that both of your thoughts on uh, filming technology, when you are making, when well, when you were making My Lens and when you are making your you know, shorts, your documentaries, um, do you have it in mind how you wish the film to be viewed as so like you, uh, when you're making my land you might make it primarily for an audience in the cinema you have that in mind as a feature film uh, that you're taking around um to film festivals um if you're doing a short documentary uh, do you have it in mind do you have that same thought process in mind about where is the viewer going to see this or is uh does that not yeah it makes i have matter. it in my mind i, I kind of have it as um uh, the audience who's the audience going to be um and where are the audience going to be yeah um so i definitely have things like that in mind i didn't not at the start i didn't necessarily know but now um i'm starting to understand a bit better where where my audience would be and, and is so i definitely have that in mind but in terms of like cinema or um film festivals I, I do think about that but mostly I think about kind of video on demand if I'm honest yeah distribution platforms yeah. Like do you think that changes the I mean just basic stuff like how, how much you have close-ups or wider shots in terms of what platform it's going to go on or um no I, I, tr I try in terms of shooting it I've tried to be as like as honest as possible to my style of cinematography that I think helps tell the story best yeah um so I, th I always have that in mind to keep my kind of style, um, mine, regardless of the platform. Um, but in terms of storytelling, again, I just try and be as, as honest as possible. But if, it, if I'm doing a corporate job, that's when it gets very different because obviously I'm working for someone. So I have to really change it up then sometimes because obviously people, I don't want to get fired. <laughs> yeah i think the dslr i mean i use a dslr in my day job yeah doing corporate stuff and uh used to use like camcorders in the past and yeah. and now it, everyone's just so used to that cinematic look aren't they and yeah. it's it's actually if you film something that's not like that even on a corporate thing it feels they're uh, not happy it's not as good doesn't yeah. it um so we're all kind of really have been seduced by the cinematic look even for small things now uh, but obviously, the practicalities of a DSLR. If you're shooting like documentary, it's, it's to react to things. It's you're, you're much. You have to really play to your the limits of what you can do with that kind of camera, don't you? And sound is a different issue as well. Yeah. So yeah. I think um, the the technology can also limit how creative you can be. And yet, uh, okay. but I mean, that's always a thing of creativity. I think when you have restrictions sometimes you, you you rise to the challenge of that and do something more interesting yeah. um so yeah 
I mean, what camera have you got? Do you use? Uh, well, I use a Canon 5D Mark okay. III, um, and uh, you know the Canon lens that we have the the, the long lens, the two seventy to two hundred lens, which is nice. just amazing. <laughs> you can't really go wrong with that lens. Yeah. Um, um, and yeah, so I think I think, but even that, I think in the corporate stuff I do, it's about short things that are about telling a story. So yeah. it's it's not so much like filming an event or a, it's more yeah. about. Uh, storytelling um, and um, so yeah the the thing about the Alexa was it just totally what was I say about the Alexa it's just it, it's performance in low light it was just incredible I mean you, you yeah. could be shooting at dusk and it, it in the camera it, it's like it can, it's brilliant it looks like daylight you know and you, there's so much range in what you get that you can use um, but it's a huge camera, you know, and, and handheld. I mean, Anna was doing a lot of handheld stuff with it, and you know, it it was really. T I mean, she's so used to doing it; she made it look easy. But you know, I picked up that camera, and I don't think I could do what she did with it. Uh, yes, yeah, so, yeah, I get what you mean. It's a different putting it together as well. Is a uh, is very different. Um, but yeah, I just think of that thing of the traditionally a storyboard. Yeah. I don't know, if you could go back to the great cinema like Orson Welles or something, they would have had a storyboard, wouldn't they? We're going to do this shot, this shot. And now I think we're in the era where it's it's looser than that. I don't know how all filmmakers work, but I, I get a sense that there's a looser thing that... I, I think, uh, again, it's going back to the technology... So is it still... No. Okay. It's going back to the technology. I, and it, it frees you up to kind of do a shot. You're not kind of loading up big... Yeah, reels yeah. and stuff it's like actually if i've if i'm walking around all day and i got you know my dslr in in my bag and i'm you know making a short clip about you know birds and, and I, I see a flock of birds i like i can shoot it right now and think nothing of it yeah. and uh you know put it on vimeo the next day once i've done my you know editing easily yeah and um I, I think from what we've seen at big picture film club in terms of what the filmmakers have been able to do with very little it's creative as hell it's like super creative out of the box yeah. storytelling uh visuals um how they're able to you know utilize you know every single resource they have to tell a story tell it well um and i think you, you couldn't you couldn't do this 15 years ago um and i think uh yeah it's 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 things like um i think like youtube has been like one of the biggest game changers because that that really introduced the wider audience to instant video uh, someone could go into you know their bedroom you know, record themselves uh and then you know spread that message to the world and then you know uh, someone you know thought hey look if people are watching this guy in their bedroom i could uh film a short film mm. and then send that to the world um you're not wrong yeah, <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. you know, everyone's got uh, vlogging now. I've seen so much of that. Yeah, lately. yeah. You know, it's not quite film, but that is literally a case of someone in their bedroom saying, "I'm just going to put myself out there with my camera." You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually kind of going um deeper into uh, like technology and to film. Um, I don't know if you guys saw it last year. There was a film called Morgan. And um, the it was it is the first film trailer to be entirely done by AI. Um, so um, IBM um, have their uh, AI program called Watson, and it kind of uh, looked at the whole film, scanned it, and then created the trailer. Right. Uh, and uh, there was a short film called Robot Skies as well. And this uh, short film, the whole film was shot by autonomous drones, which I think was wow. really creative, really yeah. creative. Um, 
kind of delving deeper and I, I it might get a bit futuristic but how, how do you think AI could play a role in technology moving forward is that the next frontier to break or um I think would it or what, what do you do you see it more as a novelty I think for me personally I think it's, it might be a novelty because yeah. in those situations it's like you can have the best camera in the world um it's about the talent behind that camera yeah you know to be the, the best cinematographer you could have avid media composer um if you're not a good editor you avid's only going to do so much so if with you know artificial intelligence you know it's how does how does it think about light in the bathroom scene when the girl's going through divorce <laughs> i don't know yeah i don't know it's these there's human things here that are going to play a major part i think and talent yeah but again i haven't seen those films you've spoken about yeah um so i, I don't know how it would work like on a larger scale on a regular basis i i think for those two examples i i think the i think the novelty of they were both solid produced films i th- i think the novelty of just kind of making that initial breakthrough was quite fascinating yeah um and um yeah you, uh, you think it was only about like uh you know 20 25 years ago when you know filmmakers really started considering filming feature lengths on digital as a really viable option it hasn't been that long um so i, I was thinking is that the, is this uh that sort of not tipping point but a pinnacle moment to note down in terms of the change of technology and how yeah it, it full well might be you know i think I, that one only time will tell yeah. it, you know it, it certainly might be but for me i just i don't know maybe i'm just too old old and miserable <laughs> <laughs> but i think there's but. a spectrum isn't there there's if you think about a, say a very small film that's almost like a personal kind of uh, voice of the filmmaker and then you go to the huge massive budget movies that, that increasingly rely on technology um, I, but I think that spectrum's always been there and I think for me personally I'm, I kind of tend towards the smaller stories that are more character and the more uh, I see the filmmaker as having a voice, the filmmakers I like it's because they have a voice and that comes through and Hollywood's always been a a, a kind of tension between that voice and the kind of industrial thing of Hollywood filmmaking, which is like, and this is, I see that as just an extension of it, really, that as the technology becomes, I mean, ultimately, I suppose you could have a thing, like you're saying, where you don't really need an original voice because the audience knows the kind of thing it likes and the machine mm. can feed it back to the audience. That's and you could already <laughs> say that that happens, doesn't it? When, yeah. you, get, yeah. when you get a sequel... Yeah. The, the industry is feeding back to the audience more of the same but it's not original creativity i'm not saying there's anything wrong with it that's the way yeah. the business works but but i think you, you know there's room within the spectrum for all of it and it'd be sad if we didn't have room for the other end of the, the spectrum as well um, but you mean the smaller end yeah well the, the thing i mean i kind of think it, it goes back to what we were saying before about the the the, the amount of uh equipment on a film set it, it becomes almost obscene in size and and it, when it gets really big and and i think that i can imagine that must be quite hard to be creatively original it's only a really special person that can really kind of cut through in that kind of size of thing and, and express themselves i think i would um you know the smaller it is it feels to me that the easier it is to express a kind of voice uh, through a film um, okay. but I think that's the challenge as it gets bigger I mean it is the movies you know you, yeah. you can't just do it in your bedroom and, forever uh, if you want to reach a big audience I mean I think there are small films that do cut through but that's the kind of uh, like paradox of it is it there's more people making small films now than ever yeah. and we can all do it but how many of those little films actually go you know really reach a massive audience uh, uh with that in mind um i mean what are you what is uh, it kind of brings back what we were talking about earlier but what is your view on 
I guess uh, going for cinema versus video on demand so like a, a stat that I got from uh, BFI was uh, and I didn't know this uh, in, in terms of the UK domestic film market uh, the top 10 distributors uh account for 95.5 percent of the market so imagine as a filmmaker you go to you know you knock on 12 doors a dozen doors and they say no <clears throat> uh, effectively your journey could end right there if you don't have these other avenues to explore like good explain. point yeah uh i mean do you do you think um, cinema will always kind of be there in the way that we kind of know it? Um, I, I think there's something... Um, I think with cinema, you have that shared experience, which you can't mimic anywhere else quite yet. You have the detail. Yeah. And um, But I, I've seen with the growing amount of filmmakers, you have this other avenue that can cater to them um do you personally prefer one over the other or you or well ironically i went to um an everyman cinema have you heard of them yeah 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 uh, I, I didn't i didn't know about them until we went and um it was yeah. so great there was no text talking behind me or <laughs> no one is it with the sofas speaking? and yeah, the the pizza? Sofa, and the they bring pizza. the pizza, don't they? Bring the pizza, <laughs> homemade guacamole. I mean, what more can I want? Uh, so it was a great experience. It wasn't like the previous couple experiences I've had where I've just thought, gosh, I've just paid, you know, and it was, weren't a good experience. So yeah. with with places like Everyman, or if any, there's one in Crouch Head now, some sort of picture house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very nice, you know, whatever. Um, and I think, that for me, those experiences are great. They're, they're worth having, you know. But when... Um, but there's something really, really great about video on demand. Yeah. Because um, I actually ironically downloaded that Flix Premiere app uh, a couple of weeks back, so I'll be watching your film. Oh, cool. Um, and that's just great. I mean, I just sat there and I thought I can download apps. Yeah. It's this Flix Premiere. I saw, saw some of the trailers. Yeah, good. I know it's like you see people on the tube watching things they've downloaded, don't yeah. you? It's changing yeah. the whole way people. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I love the cinema and I, I would always, I'd love to go, I used to really love going to the cinema, but I don't go nearly as much as I used to. And I think that's partly because I think we don't see the same range of films. I mean, I really like foreign films. I like European films. So yeah. I used to go and see quite a lot of French films and Italian films. And I don't really see as many of them getting released uh, these days in cinemas and I think it's just the whole video on demand and all the Netflix and all the yeah. box sets, the series that people binge on at home. I mean, yeah. it, it's so addictive and it's so it's so fun, isn't it? I mean, watching a really good long form drama. And I think that's another thing that sometimes I find films a bit unsatisfying because they're not they don't have the same depth that you get in a, a if you've got like twelve episodes of a series. Yeah, you really get stuck yeah. into the characters and. <clears throat> Sometimes a movie can feel, uh, you know, not as full a meal, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, I, I, I think, I think, what do I think? <laughs> I, I, I just think, I, I think the cinema is becoming more like a, a kind of theme park in a way that the big movies are really taking over. And yeah, like my kids love those movies, so I'm yeah. not knocking it. You know, it's great entertainment. Um, but that's it seems to me that the mainstream cinema is going more and more towards that and and the you know amazon and netflix can cater for more niche because if you look at something like amazon their their whole business model they sell to everyone they sell to people who are different ages different demographics so yeah it makes sense for them to make a series that will cater for something that's maybe a niche but it's still a, an audience that are going to pay and watch your product it's funny you say that it's very um, responsive you know? i read on screen daily that um amazon in the uk are currently accepting um uh, pitches for tv series like from independent yeah. uh, writers and producers nice so, one uh, yeah uh, again uh, that kind of highlights the openness on uh, video on demand um as far as i mean do you think there are too many uh, 
sequels and re-releases of old films i'm, I'm not just... the biggest fan of the reboots myself yeah. um i watched the robocop okay I, I haven't, I haven't. Uh, and i'm such it? a robocop fan i'm like <laughs> mr robocop so when i watched this reboot it kind of put the nail in the coffin for reboots now yeah i just think there's so many stories to tell but again you know the audience there's an audience out there that just seems to love them yeah. yeah. Um, so if there's going to be Fast and the Furious Part Twenty Seven, <laughs> it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that it's 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 a business thing. I mean, if it's going to sell it, they'll do it. And I, I don't think, I don't really care. I, I mean, I don't think it's my for me to kind of judge and go, or oh, they shouldn't do it because I mean, yeah. you know, it's all product. But uh, I think it is. It's definitely going more and more. I mean, yeah, the amount of sequels. The other thing I heard was the uh, the Star Wars one. Someone told me, as a guy's an editor, told me that they storyboarded the whole film through sequences from other films. So the whole wow. film is basically, and they did that to prove to the to the, the the studio funding it that this could work as a film. So it wasn't that they were going to copy that as to make the film, but it was to to demonstrate the the kind of proof that. of concept of the film. Uh, yeah, but it just shows how referential movies are these days. Everything is feeding right. off other films and and. I don't even know what original is anymore. I mean, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's, do you know what I mean? When you watch yeah. things and you just think, oh yeah, that's referencing that or it's similar to that. Um, but, you know, I don't think we're uh, in a time now where that's a problem. I think we kind of value that now. Yeah. It's kind of postmodern, isn't it? This whole thing of, um, you know, it's not, we're not kind of precious about an idea being totally pure. Uh, and I think actually that's probably always been like that with culture yeah i mean uh, there's uh i would think there's you know, there's only a certain number of ways you can tell a story but then you have the specific time of that story the specific place of that story but good point your uh, camera angles that you specifically use um but yeah i i i think um i think that distinction of video on demand for more niche audiences and the big budgets uh, going in cinema that that looks to continue yeah by all accounts. well I think you know for example with my film with the Flix premiere release yeah it's 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 amazing for a, a film made in someone a filmmaker in my position because I mean I was going to all the independent uh, film distributors trying to get it on in cinemas and you know independent um, film distributors of smaller films I mean they're really kind of on their knees you know it's just that whole thing where you would go and watch a, a, a small I mean I'm totally talking up to like five million budget movie whereas probably a few years back people would go and watch that in the cinema that stuff doesn't just doesn't get released in cinemas anymore um, and they were just saying to me look you know it's it's not your film it's just this is the way it is now we can't make any money out of small films um, so you know, the, yeah, it's a change. It's a changing uh, landscape. The whole thing of cinema distribution. I'm actually keen to know how did the the distribution situation with Flix Premier. Uh, well, they out? saw it at Rain Dance, and then uh, I was holding off because I wanted to do festivals for a year to see how it got on there. And then I was, uh, I talked to them, and they said they they'd be interested in doing it. And then I had to make a decision: would I go on iTunes or Amazon? Uh, and they said if you do it with us it has to be exclusive so um and the thing that that um uh kind of tipped it for me was was that they do quite a lot of promotion of the movies and and they do treat the film with like they they do the film because they want to they want to they like it so it's Mm. it's you're getting a kind of endorsement from them and you're getting their faith in the film and then they're they're going to advertise it online so they do a whole release Whereas, you know, the whole thing with iTunes and Amazon, you you can put it on there, you pay, it's like a grand and a half to get on there. Mm. And then the, there's no promotion. So you have to promote it yourself. And from what I've heard with independent features, you can just be lost in the all the films on Amazon and iTunes and nobody will really find it because there's just, you know, you, you, you've not got anything if you've not got a famous actor in it or, or you're, not, you're not appearing in those lists yeah. you know people are not going to even know it's there 
and if you can't promote it so you're in a kind of bind that you know you can't really get out of so i think uh these uh things like fixed premiere are potentially really good for independent filmmakers because they're, they're going to show a bit more love to your film you know and the audience that go to that platform probably go to it because they are looking for something like an independent movie uh and you know you pay four quid uh, five dollars in the u.s it's not a big amount to, to try something out is it yeah. um so i think that's another thing that like you're saying on netflix that you, you're just going oh that i'll try that out it's not because you necessarily think it's going to be an amazing film but you're just curious and yeah it's not enough money to to stop you doing that is it definitely yeah and i think again it kind of speaks to the um the advantages of uh, being um yeah uh, being on video on demand uh, um, as an indie filmmaker because uh, yeah as like i was saying on netflix like i don't I don't know half of the films I'm about to watch on Netflix. I just think, okay, does it kind of fit the genre I want to watch today? Mm. Are the reviews half good? Let me try it. Like, what's what's, what's the worst that I I haven't spent ten pounds on a single ticket at yeah. the cinema? I took like, the bus there. Yeah, bought the popcorn. <laughs> what would you say is the single thing that that convinces you to watch the thing? Would you say it's the trailer or the or just the concept of a film? Or um, I hardly watch. I hardly watch the trailers. It's it's really just the the description of the film, yeah. the genre, and half the time I literally judge a book by its cover. The artwork. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Because <laughs> we got a really cool design for our thumbnail, which is it's like this ink blotch design, uh, done by this amazing uh, designer, and um, and it's uh, it's really cool, and uh, and it's quite a, it's a, it's not a picture from the film. It's just a conceptual idea of the, what the film's about and I think it really stands out so it's going to be really interesting to see whether that um, attracts people to it because yeah. um, you know you do see those images of the floating heads and on the posters <laughs> you see them so many times you feel like you've seen all the posters before yeah, and yeah, how yeah. do you stand out Yeah. so that's a little experiment to see whether that will yeah I, I think certainly um, you know when you're you know, I'm, if I'm going on you know, Netflix or whatever and I'm kind of looking through I've got like 12 films on a on my screen at once in terms of what I can see or choose between just whatever picture looks yeah half definitely. interesting I'm yeah. gonna at least click in to investigate mm. more yeah so I think artwork is very that's interesting important. about the trailer though because uh, yeah you kind of assume that the trailer's the the thing but uh, for point. me I think um if it if a trailer comes up on my feed on my social media feeds then i might click onto it yeah. if, like a friend of mine has retweeted it or if it's come from like a, a news or media outlet that i kind of follow uh, so like uh, get out oh uh, yeah that yeah. film uh, when i first saw uh, when they first released a trailer you know towards the end of last year i think about october i was like wow got to see this that looks cool and that's that's one way a trailer would hook me and then I'm like alright yeah that's uh, really taken off hasn't it amazing yeah. actually I do need to still need to see that film yeah um, yeah that's interesting I think the yeah the whole social media thing that that's a huge endeavour as well getting your stuff promoted promoting it on it's a lot of work to do that and uh, um it's a lot of serious work, isn't it? It's bigger than ever now. Yeah, it's, I think you can. Yeah, yeah. It, that's that's quite a challenge. It's a job in it. itself. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, just to kind of you know you have you know, uh, PI agencies and marketing agencies that kind of for obviously the you know, bigger production companies yeah. manage whole social media pages. So. When to post and what to post and for why yeah. and for what platform how it differs. Yeah, I think. Yeah, and that's the other thing. Going back to being an independent filmmakers, you're kind of you, you, you're doing all these things because you can't afford to pay someone to do it so um, you know I've spent a lot of time doing that stuff but I, I know I've only really scratched the surface in terms of reach and you know it's, it's yeah it's it's when you look at movie campaigns that are really successful and social you can really see the work that's gone into them yeah um, the Batman versus Superman campaign looked really full on yeah. just, you know I couldn't escape it on social media yeah this is everywhere 
but I think a lot of I, I know a guy who who used to work for Google and he was telling me that you know when you see campaigns you kind of assume that they've kind of been viral and all these things but he said you know you, what you don't know is how much money's gone into buying space mm. or online so that it's appearing a, a lot yeah and it kind of you can kind of almost be lulled into this sense of oh this is just something that's taken off but there's a lot of money has gone into getting those ads to surface so that people are seeing them i don't think it just happens oh no way yeah loads of money yeah yeah and that's you, you know you can't that's the thing that's tough to compete with um yeah yeah and i think we um can wrap it up right here so uh graham damien uh thank you very much for taking part in the big picture film club podcast thank you for inviting me and, thank you uh, yeah Enjoyed just it. uh tell everyone where they can find you and uh, we'll also add your links to the bottom of the video somewhere but, thank yeah, you where can they find what's your twitter your facebook your at damien swaby twitter and uh damien swaby videographer on cool. instagram yeah. uh and my um twitter is at graham high graham higgins just the hi okay. and uh my film's mile end and if you just look for Myland movie online you'll find loads of stuff there's a hashtag hashtag Myland movie cool uh, you'll find the stuff nice one cool uh, thank, thank you, you. Yeah. nice <laughs> god that's so weird isn't it it's kind yeah, of it's the headphones on. rambling on and you go oh god <laughs> 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 <laughs>